Hello podcast listeners and welcome to the HJ Talks About Abuse podcast. I'm Danny Avance and I'm the Senior Associate in the Abuse Team and today I have Lucy and Amy joining me from Safeguard First, um, which is Safeguarding First, should we say, which is a new charity. So really excited to talk to you, um, both my guests about this. And of course, if there are any questions or any links, we are going to link these on the blog so you can get in contact. But before we start, I just want to give a trigger warning that we may be talking about lived experience, sexual abuse, and some things that may be a bit hard to listen to and a bit triggering. So um, if this is not the podcast for you, please do switch off, but join us at a later point. So hi, Lucy. Hi, Amy. Thank you for joining me. Hi. Hi. So some of our podcast listeners will know that I've had Lucy on twice before, so it's fantastic that you are coming back. But we're talking about something different today. So we are talking about um, Safeguarding First, which is going to, it's a new charity, and um, I'm going to hand over to you both first. But if any of our listeners are um, wanting to find this, it's just important to say it's Safeguarding First, but the number one, um, so that you can find it. So over to you both. Yes, yeah, so um, I've been, like you said, I've been on the podcast before with um, Yours in Scouting and we led a campaign that has um, kind of culminated in the Scouts changing a lot of their safeguarding systems. And one of the things that was really highlighted during that was um, the kind of lack of, of quality face-to-face safeguarding training out there for voluntary organisations and for volunteers. I know that um, you know, obviously a lot of these, well, all of these charities and children's organisations hopefully are doing the mandatory modules, but a lot of that is online and can be done very, very quickly with not a huge amount of kind of engagement and real understanding. So what we wanted to do was um, create a charity that offers that face-to-face safeguarding training to people and um, you know, make sure that they've got a real comprehensive understanding of safeguarding and how to look after young people and not just kind of a tick box exercise which you know as a teacher I do every year and I know that it is a very very quick thing that you you can do without a huge amount of kind of comprehension around the topic and around what it really means to put in a safeguarding form and how to do it and what to write on it and how to do it properly yeah, sadly, I think when when you do do some mandatory training, sometimes, especially if you're starting a new job or anything, it all feels a bit overwhelming. And especially if, it's a, if, it, if it's a click through process, I think we've all been guilty at some stage of feeling the quash of got to get it done. So you've clicked yeah. through. And obviously, what we're talking about, it is fundamental that this is done mm. with full understanding, because frankly, you know, that could be saving a potential person from life-changing incidents that will as I say impact them for forever more so fantastic charity so um to talk anyone through that w- has listened to what you've just said and thought wow this is for me um what is the charity going to offer specifically and how do people get in contact with you if it's something that they think is going to be helpful to them so we've got um, a website, Safeguarding First. So it's safeguarding and then 1st.com. Um, and there's a contact us page on there, which we're very happy for people to get and keen for people to get in contact with us through, um, should they want to. My details are on there and Amy's will be as well shortly, um, who is our other director at the charity. And um, yeah, so we will be offering safeguarding training. We've currently got an accredited safeguarding training so we put it through the um cpd organized cpd certification organization i can never remember the name of it fully but the cpd <laughs> yeah accreditation. accreditation and more on the way as well more um, training being written at the moment that's it yeah so that's it we've we've been looking at an autism one this evening haven't we amy um mm-hmm. to work with children with autism so it's not just the fundamental safeguarding it is kind of looking at creating organizations that are safe and inclusive for all okay so it can be slightly tailored as well then depending on who who's potentially contacting you because i guess certain organizations will have slightly different safeguarding Mm. needs 
Yeah, definitely. And I mean, I think one of our unique selling points is that we are coming from a perspective of we both have that lived experience of when safeguarding isn't implemented when it is kind of pushed down the list of priorities and we want to make use of that lived experience and be able to offer that to people who are currently in positions of trust and looking after young people and be able to say you know what we've been there what do you want to ask us what can we help you with what is it that you need to look for to know if something is going wrong or if there is a child at risk what you should you be looking out for and I know these are things that are are to a degree covered in mandatory training that you can get elsewhere but this is the opportunity for people to ask us frank questions and for us to bring that experience to the table and use terrible things for good hopefully to hopefully keep other young people safe yeah, I think that's fantastic because, as you say, um, with safeguarding training, sometimes it, it doesn't, like other training, doesn't naturally come to life. But but mm. with your lived experiences, I, I think people will very much take it a lot more seriously, sadly, if they, they haven't before. So fantastic. So what are the aims going to be? So when I bring you on in a year's time, w- w- what's the aim? How is it going to progress? What we're working towards at the moment is running um, an online session and each week. And then we're also looking at doing an in-person session each week in the long term. Okay. So we're hoping um, to be able to offer that UK wide online session. We're going to potentially offer the autism course in a few weeks as our first session. It's a bit of a pilot run, which is really exciting. Um, and we we want to offer them kind of out of work hours so that volunteers yeah. can do them, you know, mm-hmm. kind of in like 90 minute ish long sessions. And so they fit really nicely and they're not a huge burden. So obviously we all know that you get home and the last thing you want to do is sit on a 90 minute kind of webinar or seminar. But actually they'll be 90 minutes, really informative. They'll feel really, really worthwhile and worth doing. And you'll come away with lots of new ideas and you know, of understanding of how you can really implement these things. So how you can really ensure that safeguarding is a core practice in your you know, club, group, extracurricular activity, or you know, come away with an understanding of how you can better cater to neurodiverse young people and children and how you can better include them in your organisation, not only for them, but to make it easier for yourself. Um, you know, if you are someone working in a voluntary organisation without that kind of training and experience it, it can be quite difficult and quite stressful you know on you if you don't if you don't have that that support and that understanding of how to do it yeah I agree especially when you, you know anyone that's been listening to this podcast for a long time knows that we've been talking about mandatory reporting for years mm. now and obviously mm. there still isn't very much movement on it so I think any training that deals with safeguarding and provides additional support to individuals as you know I think you and Lucy I we talked about last time sometimes with safeguarding you can be in quite a difficult position because you can be in an organization that may be friends for years family for years and so anything that strengthens this training or highlights you, you know things to look out for I'm always very very positive for we were saying weren't we Amy we we had you know very similar experiences in two very different organizations um and you know it, it absolutely is occurring everywhere and I know for me and I think you know, I'm sure Amy can probably agree but she can speak for herself in a, in a sec um that you know I think one of the issues in my case was that the abuser was you know a heavily involved person within the group and someone that people thought of as you know a great person and really involved and they you know was their friend and it was very difficult for them to you know then speak out against that person and even when things did come to a light um people you know continued to cover up because they were protecting families and friends and people they'd known for years and I don't know Amy if you found the same where you Mm. were to a degree but the thing is is uh so my experience is um I was abused within um a church setting so the Salvation Army um I was a teenager and my abuser was a man in his late 30s he was well known to 
really interested, too interested in young people. And multiple adults had warned me about not spending too much time with him because of his reputation. People were well aware that something was wrong and I was spending a lot of time with this person alone. Um, you know, I received music lessons in his bedroom that was well known um, at that church that everybody knew about it so there people knew that this person was untrustworthy and yet still um nobody uh, when rumors kind of arose about there being a relationship between us nobody approached the police the paperwork that should have been filled out was not completed correctly it, it was just you know brushed under the carpet nobody even approached my parents to tell my parents that something was wrong uh, they were not members of the church but obviously from attending for many years I started through uh, girls brigade which is a kind of mm -hmm. like brownies um that kind of thing but like maybe you're a more religious version people knew who my parents were they had their contact numbers and yet even though uh, people definitely had their suspicions and um confronted uh, me and asked me if there was a relationship they still didn't tell my parents they still didn't do that kind of reporting of any suspicions so people knew this guy was like not trustworthy but even so still didn't report yeah I think and sadly it, it, you hear you know just like your lived experience many many people that that are saying the same and exactly safeguarding mandatory reporting you, you know would that situation be repeated now if you know your efforts what, what you're doing were in place you know so I think giving people that the really empowering people to know the steps to report and to have confidence in that process of how to do it can be really helpful because it could be you know that one person, maybe other people ignore it, but that one person, you know, who's done our training feels, no, do you know what? I know that I need to do this form. I can send it to this person and then mm -hmm. it's out of my hands. That could be really empowering. And, you know, just that simple step from one person could go on to save, you know, save that child from continued abuse or hopefully stop it before it even starts happening if they've seen something, you know, earlier on. Or as Amy was saying, you know, if it's someone with a reputation hopefully kind of low level concerns will have been reported and things like that and they'll have a picture will have built up earlier before that person's able to go on and you know commit actual abuse yeah because i think that's one of the concerns that my experience of, of having worked with many um victims or survivors is that actually quite often exactly like this scenario you've said amy is that there's low level whispers low level whispers mm. um you know and perhaps that person goes up or moves away and then starts again and it's it's you know a, it's sort of a circle of a process and it's almost that you know if if the police have been informed it, you know that there's no thought process of tracking where this individual has potentially gone specifically in the scenario that you're um, discussing historically quite often if there were whispers that person would bounce and move on very quickly before you know their their role because yeah. as and he had about, previously done so yeah positions of trust that actually they, they were move location rather than facing the issue um so yeah. think, sorry I just I wanted to say I wanted to highlight for both of like in me and Amy's cases they're not historical in the sense of kind of historical abuse we're not talking about kind of Jimmy Savile times these are you know post 2004 oh, very recent situations yeah. that are you know that aren't kind of imminent his like imminent recent things yeah within yeah. the last but 20 years of absolutely within a time where people would have been saying oh it's not like that anymore um yeah. or you know we we know how to look after children now so it's it's not that we're thinking of of obviously like it's absolutely horrid and we should have been getting it right for the whole of history but it's yeah. not a time, you know, our experiences aren't at a time where we can say all oh, things have moved on from there because, you know, they haven't. These are still yeah. experiences that happened in very recent history and are not historical in the sense of historical abuse. So we yeah. need to be training people in order to deal with or with situations such as what we experienced because they are very possibly occurring up and down the country still. 
yeah, um, within absolutely. many different organisations. Well, they're definitely happening, you know, up and down the country in organisations. So yeah, well, we're still we're still seeing this, aren't we, with statistics? But you know, ultimately, statistics are always lower because we know people will not disclose until probably much later on in life if they do mm. at all. That's um, it, and that's what we saw you know in the the scouting thing was that there was a lot of disclosures from a long long time ago but similarly we were starting to get some from more recently and from um you know after 2014 we got a lot of um you know disclosures from then so it does show that you know that one organization it it must be happening elsewhere yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, so. for my listeners, to clear, when I say historical, I mean the types of cases that, you know, when we're really talking about when someone could uh, could bounce a job and there was no mm-hmm. sort of electronic way of checking the CV or checking. So we're talking yeah. a long, long time ago. But That's it. Yeah. Absolutely, it's still, you know, um, a major, major issue. You know, we're seeing on the news. You are having reports in your with your other hat on. Um and yeah, yeah. you know and the cases we're having come in you know still things are happening within the last six months or a year or or or, or whatever so um I'd have hoped that in this when we got to this point in our lives that actually you know and with all the tech and all the things that we've progressed in as you know a community that actually safeguarding would be absolutely up there but as you're both highlighting there's still major holes um I think it's much easier to think oh, it's all okay, it wouldn't happen here, than it is to really face it and really implement it for a lot of people. Mm. Especially when you're looking at people that you've perhaps worked with for a long time, uh, that you're possibly very close to, uh, and kind of looking at a situation and thinking, well, you know, this young person in this situation, maybe they seem uh, withdrawn, maybe they seem like they're kind of uh, possessively clinging f- to this person in a position of trust and asking yourself those uncomfortable questions, asking why is that? Do, does something feel uncomfortable to me? Or why is that? And following those processes. So if something is wrong, you're hopefully um, rescuing that child from uh, like a deeply traumatic experience. And if not, then you have asked the question Mm. anyway, because better to be sure. So anyone that's obviously listening to this podcast and thinks, yes, this is for me, I want to, you know, sign up, I want to join. Are they able to have almost drop in sessions or is it um, a course of a period of time or always at a 90 minute session that should cover everything? So just so our listeners know, or is that still in the process of being so worked out? We will be offering online courses that people can sign up to. So it will be a case of they sign up um, to a session which will be on a certain night, which will be a lead session um, and we will advertise through our website. And they'll they'll be able to book on to following a link on the website. Um, if they did want something more specific or to give us, you know, a, maybe advice or a suggestion of courses that they would like to see us do, if they email Lucy at safeguardingfirst.com, so it's safeguarding1st.com or Amy at safeguardingfirst.com, um, we'd be really, really happy to hear what people's ideas are and what people feel that you know, they need because we've had our experiences. I still work in the sector. I know Amy's working um, with the carers, I believe. Amy? Mm, yeah, my my role at the moment is I support um, unpaid carers. I work at Helpline, actually, providing kind of a mix of information and guidance and like emotional and mental health support. And um, a lot of my role is signposting to other organisations. And I think that's something that we can definitely work towards doing through our website. Um, Say you were a parent who came onto our website and you were concerned about um, something that you had suspected had happened with your child or or your child had made a disclosure. I'm sure we can kind of work towards having some resources to point people towards um, in addition to the training that we um, are working towards offering. So um, people who are concerned can be hopefully pointed in the right direction as well. Absolutely. We do have, um, we've got some online advice for parents for um, kind of locking down computers and making sure that they're, their devices are safer for children to use and as Amy was saying we will be able to work towards more 
offering more things like that and more resources because it is really important and you know we're, we're parents we work in you know sectors that do keep us in the loop with much of this but we don't know what everyone wants so by having people contact us and let us know what they want you know it, it does really help support us and make sure that we're offering the best service possible Mm, and we'll be asking for feedback following our courses as well. And, and, you know, we really want honest feedback from people because the reason why we're doing this is because we want to help. Um, and if there's something that people feel having uh, received our content, they feel that we should be doing differently. We are more than happy to take suggestions on board so we can provide the best possible information for people. Yeah, fantastic. I mean, I was just thinking that there'll be quite a few individuals and as you say, even parents that perhaps have never been in a safeguarding role, for example. So this has not been effectively applicable. So, you know, or you'd think wouldn't be applicable, but then, you know, do have a child and then are helping out with the local football team or are doing. And I guess that's the type of role then that, you know, they may think, actually, no, I really need to have some training here on this. That's the kind of, you know, that is a big portion of our target market of the the people we're looking to offer training to because you know as a parent you do come into contact you know you've got your own children to look after and that's such a responsibility and you know you do come in contact with lots of other children lots of other young people as well so you know this training is valuable for anyone yeah and it isn't just you know we are talking about volunteers because that's the people who you know we feel you know need it the most but absolutely you know anyone anyone in in the UK is welcome to join the training and we'll get something out of it and we'll get an understanding of you know, of safeguarding and what they can do if they have concerns about a child. Mm, yeah, I mean, I think that's something we can definitely look, work towards uh, providing. Because say if you take the example of um, your child invites another child around for a play date and you notice that something about that child doesn't seem right. They seem very withdrawn. They kind of you you approach them uh, like maybe to give them some dinner and they flinch away from you. Uh, and some some advice for parents of what to do in that situation. They've got concerns about this other child and they want to make sure they're they're safe, you know, giving some people resources around that as well yeah and that's the exactly the sort of scenario that I guess we talked about when we talked about at the start about you know sometimes organizations but what we were focusing on originally you know they're run by family members but in this, that mm. scenario as well you, you know you've still got to effectively face that other parent at the school gates or you know yes. if you report it to the school or you report it you know to an online charity or, or you know so I'm sure some parents will naturally question themselves like when we talk about sexual abuse generally we we question our reactions our thoughts our feelings about something mm -hmm. our gut instinct about it you, you know that you can see that dilemma exactly great example mm -hmm. that you would think oh gosh you know have I read this wrong actually you know am I going to get this parent into trouble if actually you know that there, there isn't anything wrong so yeah I really see that that's it. And I think like when, when you reported it you do feel that weight off as well so if you have got concerns you know and if it is like you're saying something like a child having a child brown for tea if there's no other reports about that child you know that's not going to go anywhere but you know that you've done the right thing yeah and you know that you know if there are you know 30 other reports about different things and that adds to another picture into a bigger picture you know you again help to protect that child so it is it's you know it covers that child's back almost you're you're looking after them and you're making sure that they're safe and doing what you can but you know, if you've got a, a low level safeguarding concern, you're absolutely not going to, you know, report that person to whoever and then they're going to lose their child over it. It's not that's not how it works. And I think it's yeah. really important, again, to support people to know that because it's a scary thing. I know, mm. you know, it's it for, my, for myself and for other people, you always question yourself and you always think, you know, am I doing the right thing in reporting this concern? Yeah. Um, but again, it gives, like I said, it gives people that confidence that actually, you know, they can report it. And if it is nothing, then it will be kind of kept on file, but it's not going to be a huge issue and cause, you know, huge issues for that family. And that's that's really good to know because you know obviously both of your roles have, have you know helped mm. you, you learn that. But for mm. I, I imagine a parent that is you know had their own children but haven't ever worked in that role yeah. before, we think, oh my gosh, if I report this, social services are going to come around, they're going to take the child away, you know, and so so you can see 
why sadly you know some people are reluctant to report but but, you know as you say it's absolutely essential that if there are concerns that things are reported that's yeah you know these small concerns they create a bigger picture don't they potentially or you know the child's had a bad day and is feeling a bit a bit nervous you know either way you've done the right thing reporting it because you may have added to a bigger picture or you may have you know just done the right thing ultimately and I think as well around the issue of um, what to do and what to say if a child or an adult who has been uh, the, a survivor of abuse from childhood makes a disclosure to you, the process that you should follow, what you should say, what you should not say. I think a lot of people would not know what to do if they were put in that position. And I definitely think there's scope for us to offer some advice around that. Yeah, that, that's often actually very true for, for clients that, that I represent is that mm-hmm. perhaps the first disclosure they, they've made have been to somebody who, you know, sadly is misconstrued what they've said or mm-hmm. not quite taken it for, for what it actually truly has meant. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, specifically for, for someone like you, Lucy, who's been trained as, a, as a, a teacher, you would be really hot on, you know, a, a child mm-hmm. disclosing anything to you, but actually in other certain professions again I think or you know you're just you're working yeah exactly as a volunteer perhaps and you've never done a role like that you've never perhaps Mm. worked closely with children before and and children especially if it's a young child can disclose in very different ways it's not necessarily directly oh this has happened to me it can be quite difficult to decipher or yeah difficult to and if, if you don't know what to do, and you don't know how to respond. Like you're saying that you can accidentally look, completely shut that child down. And, you know, they may never speak about it again or they may take a long, long time to come forward again. Well, fantastic, guys. I'm really looking forward to seeing um, this grow. Um, and it's important to say if anybody, again, so we will link all the contact details um, if anyone wants to get in touch. But also um, on your website, that, that there's um, an area just saying if anyone's interested in supporting the fundraising efforts to get in contact with you. So it'll be good to see what you've got up your sleeves in regards to that. And anyone who's listening who wants to support them, by all means, do get in contact with Lucy and Amy. Yeah, no, that'd yeah. be great. Please so do. Uh, we do have a launch event coming up in October that might be good to make people aware of. Oh, mm-hmm. fabulous. Yeah. So please give us the details of that. Do we know where it is yet or what's going to be happening? So, yeah, so we, we're not we're not 100 percent sure on, on the final details, but we've booked um, we've booked an event at Sheffield Hallam University in October um, to kind of do a bigger launch and to kind of hopefully make the public more and more aware of us and what we offer. Okay, so podcast listeners, we will keep you updated on that. We will tweet once the details are confirmed. Um, But thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Amy. And as I say, uh, thank you for listening, podcast listeners. If you've got any questions for Lucy or Amy or myself, please do email either to me or to Lucy and Amy and um, one of us can come back to you. So thanks, everyone. Thanks both. Thank you, Danielle.